I'm very pleased to have David Schant here today to uh, talk a little bit about um, urban design uh, the, and how one represents urban design. And it's, uh, it's a very important part of urban design is to be able to draw it. You can't actually design the urban environment if you can't draw it, if you can't represent it in some way that people can feel like they can become part of it. That David is a partner in Urban Design Associates in uh, Pittsburgh. It's one of the top urban design firms in the United States. In fact, I always think of the Urban Design Associates as one of the first firms to come out and actually focus on ur urban design. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm really pleased to, ha to have him here. Uh, have, David's going to show some of his work and talk about his work, but he, he also has some beautiful examples here. And, and that, that I know will also be a good conversation. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, let's welcome David. So thanks. Thanks, Andrew. So my name is David Shant, and I am an architectural illustrator. Uh, I work for a, a firm called Urban Design Associates in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, Urban Design Associates was formed in 1964 um, by a gentleman from, uh, uh, or from uh, South Africa. David Lewis. And uh, David Lewis was sort of chased out of South Africa because of apartheid. He was a, um, a proponent of uh, fair and equitable housing and equitable uh, relationships with everyone. So when he went through Europe, he, 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 he trained in, uh, in England, uh, moved to America, and uh, ended up at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh to form the Urban Design Lab, which was one of the first sort of urban design program organizations in the country. Um, at that same time, he formed Urban Design Associates as a firm that would, would uh, initiate some of the theories and ideas he had about fair housing. So I do stuff like this. We do drawings. Um, one of the things about Urban Design Associates that's unique is there has always been someone on staff that, that displays and explains the urban form through drawing. We always do it in-house. Uh, before me, one of the other senior partners was, uh, was the chief illustrator um, I am now. So we push the window on, um, on what kind of image pr propels our work. It could be something like this, which is a project in Calgary. And it's not, just about, it's not just about the buildings. It's not just about the location. It's about all the things, all the components that make up good urban design. So a place like this, you know, it resonates. It tells you things about it. You know, the fact that it's never been built yet, or it wasn't built at the time, um, we don't, that doesn't enter into our conversation. We're trying to clearly explain um, what our thoughts are about the, the area that we're, we're working on. So, you know, we may end up at a place like this, which is in Herndon, Virginia, and here's what it looks like now, you know. And my job is to take it, you know, and, and start to craft it into a place that'll be ultimately like this. And very often, the, this kind of work is done on the road. It's done in front of the people that are working on the project because we believe that you need to be there in place to do this kind of work, um, to get everybody in a room and get their ideas out and get their, their, their policies and their statements about where they are. They've, they've been experts on the land and the place that you're working longer than you have, so you need to have their input. So I've gotten very used to doing drawings that collate all the information that's happening around me into something that becomes a key image to explain something that's very difficult to explain. So, you know, something complicated like a, like a transit uh, development like this, this is a TND that's happening in Pittsburgh, you know, we'll, we'll build a simple SketchUp model like that, but you have to put life into it, you have to breathe, you know, character into it. And you can see that my drawings are done by hand. Um, um, the core pieces of my drawings are always done by hand because I feel like I can inject a lot more, I can, I can edit and I can explain a lot more by hand drawing than I can digitally. Here's a piece for Pittsburgh. Uh, um, this is the new um, arena uh, area where they're going to have all kinds of uh, new development in the city. So it could be any time of day that you're, that you're showing your image. The power of the image needs to, to carry through. It needs to explain. It needs to invigorate people. So how did I get into this? I'm not an architect. In fact, I never went to school for architecture. I have a degree in, um, in uh, graphic design. I have a degree in art history. And I have a master's degree in MFA in, in fine art. So how did I get into this? Well, I always like this. This is my daughter, first of all. And when she draws a picture, that's what it looks like, OK? But you, can, you look at that picture, and you know exactly what it is. You know, it's a branch with some birds sitting on it. And the leaves are green, and the branch is brown. It's very simple, but it's very clear. There's a clarity to what kids do 
that I think should resonate in all the drawings that you do. We, when we get older, we get all these pretenses around us. Oh my God, I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to do this. It's better just to let go and draw. So I always put this at the beginning because I, I like that. Here's another one of her drawings. I love these things. Just great. So when I was growing up, things that were important to me, I, I, I was always interested in drawing. But there was things happening around me that really influenced the way I thought about things. One of the big things was this movie that came out in the 70s, and I, it, it captivated me how someone could design and develop an entire world for the screen that was different than what we have, and somebody had to draw all that. So I became fascinated with how all that happened. And comic books, I was very much into comic books. I loved to draw. What I liked about comic books was not so much the characters, but that someone was creating, on the, they were creating in these frames a story that was told through imagery. And I really thought that was powerful stuff. So I got very interested in that. And I, I actually, you know, that was some, the career move that I was hoping to make someday was to go into this. I had a lot of friends that went into this. Um, but then suddenly, I also was very interested in architecture. I always liked the form of the built world. I liked looking at the details of architecture. I came upon this book back in the early 80s, and um, I was lucky to find an, an, an original edition of this. And this book changed the way I looked at things. All of a sudden, on the pages, I saw a drawing like this. And I thought to myself, oh my god, how did anybody, how could anybody approach doing something like this. this. This is not an existing building. This was a building of a proposed existing thing. And it took me a long time to figure out how could anybody come up with this and breathe that much life into a subject. So I became very interested in that. The detail in these drawings was absolutely incredible. Now these were done in the 1920s, so it was done at a time that was different than when I was trying to execute them. So I had to go back and sort of research and find out exactly how this stuff was done. And to be truthful, there wasn't too many people around that were ready to explain it to me. My dad was an electrician, my mother was a teacher, and I didn't have anybody I knew that was an artist, so I had to start searching out people that could tell me about these things. Here's another one, look at this. I mean, the technique that you could see in these books was absolutely incredible. I didn't know how it was done, but I really wanted to learn how it was done. This is a pencil drawing, and it's tinted with, uh, with uh, gouache watercolor. And in the books was all these great examples of how to explain how to focus on composition, how to, how to manipulate the form to tell the story that you wanted it to tell. That's invaluable stuff. I've yet to come upon another book that explains it as well as this does. So every page broke down things and said, this is the way you do it. This is the way you do it. And the, the, the guy who wrote this book, Arthur Guptill, did all these drawings. So it's a direct connection to him, which I found fascinating. And plus these great, these great examples by all these different artists of how they handled this. It was, just, it was just everything from the lettering to the way the sheet was laid out. All of those things were very captivating to me. Then of course you see uh, drawings like this. You just can't believe that someone could do work like that. Look at that. Beautiful stuff. So I found that book, but I needed to find more things that I was interested in. So I started looking at different painters. Um, uh, Andrew Wyeth, you know, look at the, look at the, the character of the color in this painting. The, the quality of, of just the, the, the invigorating use of, of color in these things. The quality of detail, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not normally, there's, there's so much beautiful modeling that's done in these things. So I started looking at all these images. Look, look at, the, look at the, the quality of the story that's in these images is really what's important. And the more I read about him, the more I realized that he was trying to do the same kind of things that I was interested in, which was telling a story through drawing and painting. And really looking, looking carefully at what his environment was telling him. So this is all well and good. These are great things. But how do you translate that into a job, right? This is nice. I like this. This is Edward Hopper. Beautiful stuff. Simple, effective, great color. Look at the angle. The angle is different. You wouldn't normally look up at something like that and paint it from that angle. Being able to take a subject that's complicated and simplify it. You know, the, the lessons are in there. Look at the backlight of this. No one would normally take a look at something like that. It's beautiful. Uh, Winslow Homer. I mean, that painting is as fresh today as it was 100 years ago. The quality of the color is absolutely amazing. The way that this is all mixed in the background in those oranges and greens, that's what I wanted my work to look like. So I looked through all these images. This is Fairfield Porter. Another really great artist. Look at the quality of the light. And then I looked at some professional influences. These are, these are guys that were working at the same time that I was working 
developing my skills. This is Ted Kotsky. He was a real famous pencil draftsman and renderer in the 1940s. Unfortunately, he died young, but his pencil drawings were incredibly good. But few people realize that he was a great painter as well. His style translated really well to paint. And there's a, there's a quality of confidence to the way that this is drawn that I really enjoy. This is John Pike who was a real famous watercolorist from the 40s. I mean, look at the character of that. I look at that and I think, you know, how do you even start to craft an image that's that powerful? You know, this is David, uh, this is David Curtis, who's an English guy. And, uh, you know, painting stone and the quality of light in England, beautiful stuff, look at, the, look at that painting. So, as an architectural illustrator, and in learning how to do this, I'm in school, you know, I'm learning graphic design, I'm learning all this stuff, but my heart is really here, this is what I want to know, you know? Oh, that's a sideways Tom Lynch. <laughs> There's another one of his. But when you look at this, even though it's sideways, you look at the way the, the color is poured into that. It's absolutely incredible the way that's done. There's some of the other works, and you can see the quality of the light in these. I didn't see architectural illustration that had this kind of artistic quality going on in it at the time. Here's another John Pike. There's another one. Another one. Look at that background. Beautiful. The subject, well, the subject's all right. I'm not terribly interested in the subject, but I'm interested in the way he's manipulating his media. That's what I was interested in. This is Randolph Bay from Philadelphia. And I just love the quality of the darks in these paintings. They're just beautiful. And they look like Pennsylvania. They look like the place. This is David Millard, Charles Reed. So you've seen a lot of paintings. So how does that translate to architectural rendering? Well, this is, uh, this is Elizabeth Day, a Texan. This is one of her paintings. Um, she's a professional architectural illustrator here in Texas. And she set the standard for a lot of the way things are painted. And you can see a lot of the technique in this that you saw in some of those previous ones. These are all folks that are friends of mine now. Um, they're all in an organization called ASAI, which is the American Society of Architectural Illustrators. And, um, if, you do, if you're not a member of that, it's something you may want to think about it, even as a student. They have a great competition every year. You get to, they have a convention every year. You get to meet all these folks. They all show up. And it's a great opportunity to meet some of these folks that still do some of this really high quality work. There's another one. That's Richard Chenoweth from the East Coast. So that's uh, Clark Keitel from Kansas City. And you can see the quality of these. Some of the, some of the stuff we just looked at from those other painters is in this work. This is a guy who lives in my neighborhood, actually, um, and he does these great pencil drawings. And this is just, the way that this describes these buildings is wonderful. There's another one. That's a great piece of work. That's Dick Sneary from uh, Kansas City. Michael Reardon. So, okay. So, I, I learned all this stuff. I was in school. I decided to uh, see if I could get a job doing this. So after I graduated with these degrees, I found uh, um, a guy that was doing architectural rendering in Buffalo, New York, where I was from. And uh, he had uh, been practicing architectural rendering for quite a while. And in Florida, he came out of uh, Jewel Sheffer Studios in Florida. Sheffer Studios was known for tempera painting. Um, but he was actually a pen and ink draftsman and was the only guy that Sheffer ever had that did that. And, and he had also worked for uh, Portman's off, John Portman in Atlanta. So he had this lineage of all of this work that he had done for these high profile clients. And I wanted to know what he was doing. So he hired me at a ridiculously low salary. I mean, it wasn't even a salary. It was sort of like when he thought about paying me, he paid me. But I went in and I worked with him for a couple of years. And I really learned the difference between liking to draw and being able to craft an image that is powerful and saleable, usable in the marketplace. Um, he also, we were also experimenting a lot with watercolor because at the time, most of the work that we had been doing was, was sort of modern architecture. A lot of it was concrete based. So a lot of the renderings that were being done at the, at the time were done in airbrush. So a lot of our, our renderings were airbrush. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, the guy that uh, he emulated his style. It'll come to me in a minute. It's not there right now. but. Um, so we were doing all these airbrush ink line drawings, and we started to experiment with watercolor. And I found, thinking back to all of this research and all these things that I have been experimenting with, that boy, that, that's really something to push. But unfortunately, we didn't know really how to take it. And at the time, it was very difficult to get any kind of reproductions to paint on. You, know, you had to do everything by hand. Your copy machines and computers and all these things hadn't really caught up with, with 
being able to manipulate media yet. So we were still sort of figuring out a system by which we would draw. So over the years, I started work, I worked with him for a couple of years, and I moved to Cincinnati, and I taught at the University of Cincinnati and at Northern Kentucky University, and I did a lot of freelance work. And I started to meet some other people that were interested in the same kind of things that I was. And I started to put together a, a system. At the time, black and white uh, copies started to come out where you could print onto watercolor paper. This was around 1990 or so. And I was always interested in trying to get my ink line image onto some kind of paper that I could color where I didn't have to do it by hand. Because once you start to do it by hand, if you make a mistake or you have to go back, it, it costs you lots of time. And time is money when you're trying to do these things. So, you know, um, we were still laying everything out by hand. We were still doing um, traditional plan projection drawings. Everybody know what plan projection perspectives are? Laying out a two point and a three point perspective by hand? It's great to know, but it's excruciating, you know? And the, the, the difficult part of it is, is when you're sitting in front of a client and you, want to ex you, you have to explain what this view is going to look like, they're not going to know what it looks like until you lay it out. And you have to go back to the office to lay it out. So um, very early on, around the same time in 1990s, um, I started using a program called Mac Perspective, which was one of the earliest programs that would do perspective uh, layout techniques. And um, it was a very simple program, but extremely effective. And it was a vector-based program. So the, the, the base drawing that came out of it was not, how many people use SketchUp today? You guys know what SketchUp is? Yeah, it's kind of it was kind of like that, but it was in 1991 or 92. So it was it was it was great because you could you could generate multiple views, and then you could draw over them. You could use them as a base underneath what you were doing. So let's talk about materials and supplies for a minute. I don't know why it's in here at this point, but I'm going to talk about it. I use traditional media in every way I can, but I also use digital media because media is media. Whether you're using a computer or you're using a brush, they're all as important, equally as important. And they're all powerful. So you want to pick the one that best suits the situation you're working in. Now, I do a lot of work on the road. I do a lot of design charrettes. You guys know what charrettes are? I'm sure you do. Um, most of my work is done on the road. So I have to carry the equipment with me that I can use to make the image that I need. And it has to be done in the time frame that I'm there, which is usually three or four days. I usually do three or four renderings in three or four days to, to execute the story. Um, so I bring the printer with me, I bring the scanner with me, I bring everything I need to take that image from one end to the other. And media, I take all that with me too. And you know, I've, I've gone through the years, I've, I've experimented with various media and I've come upon the things that I like to use the best. Um, I like to use high quality papers. I've tried all different kinds of papers. This is something that you guys need to do as, as architects and artists. You need to try the media that's out there because every media works differently and every person draws differently. So you want to explore, you know, you want to get a bunch of different things and you want to try it out, you know. Uh, my, my old standard is still the 12-inch roll of trace. I love to, love to draw on that. Brushes, you got to have the right stuff, you got to have the right tools. They have to be of, the, of good quality, otherwise your work is going to suffer. Paints, I use Holbein paints, which are um, a much brighter version of a lot of the watercolor paints that you use. If you buy student grade paints, they're fine, but they're not going to give you the, the sort of vibrancy that you really need and you're gonna it's almost like you're crippling yourself before you start so you'd be better off buying three or four tubes of really good paint than 12 tubes of mediocre paint because it'll make your painting easier and you should experiment you should try different things that you haven't tried before you know there, there's there's a range of different professional tubes that I've tried and used my favorite one is the Holbein ones though pens how many people have a favorite pen I bet you do. Yeah, well, all the old guys raise their hand because I know. Uh, pens, are, pens are wonderful, and there's so many different kinds. And every one of them makes a different mark, you know? And so, and, and on paper, every paper, they make a different mark. And some are better on mylar, some are better on trace. I use all different kinds of pens, and I never know which one I'm going to use first until I'm in the situation that I need, so I always have them with me. Sketchbooks. How many people keep a sketchbook? Yeah? Do you have drawings in it? Yeah? That's good. It's, it's important to, to be thinking about and experimenting with the, the things that captivate you. When you're out in the world and you see these things, sure, it's great to photograph it with your iPhone, but sit down and really look at it for a few minutes and make a little sketch. I, I guarantee you, you'll remember that. It'll be important to you. When you go and you experiment with an idea in architecture, you'll have something that you've already worked on in your mind a little bit. And again, all these different papers. My sketchbooks are filled with drawings like this that have notations about the time of day, the light, 
what I saw, the shadow patterns, all of these things that they, they, they make it into my work later. Because I'm, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm jarring my visual memory. I'm pushing stuff in there that I'm going to use later on. So I have pages and pages of this stuff. I can't, you know, I, I do it all the time. Wherever I go when I'm traveling, if I'm, if I'm waiting for a plane, you know, I got a little piece of paper, I'm doodling like this. And I make my own sketchbooks. I make different sizes because I think it's important that you have something that's just yours. And I like to work in odd shapes, so I have all these different size sketchbooks. You can go to Kinko's and you can have them make one of these out of watercolor paper or anything you want, and you, they can bind it for you for a couple of bucks. And then it's yours, you know? It's something really cool. So let me, let me take, you, take you through how I'm, I draw something. Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay, wow. Either, either you're all just numb or, no, no, that's okay. Okay, so my drawings are typically line-based. I like to draw in ink on tracing paper or on some sort of substrate like mylar or vellum. And I construct the image and I, and I, and I draw it completely and fully in line before I ever color it. So it's a standalone image. Now this, this image here doesn't have any shadow um, or depth or strength of darks in it yet. I, I, I've made the decision that ultimately this is going to be painted. So it stays like that. This is another one. And you can see that the shadows are they're, they're inferred, but they're not filled yet. So this is, this is sort of almost like a contour drawing that's ready for color. Now this one is hard lined, and this one is freehand. And depending on what I'm working on, um, you know, that's, that's how I decide whether or not it, it wants to stay looser or not so loose. But even though it's freehand, it's still very, you know, the, the proportions and everything is drawn correctly. There's not, there's not a lot of uh, missed notes in there. And there's, you can see how I've added trees and all kinds of things to it. But the essence of the architecture and the things I want you to see have been edited in so that you, there's nothing obscuring them. But the appearance of foreground, middle ground, and background is very strong in these drawings. They're like stage sets. You need to have things that lead you into the drawing. You know, you have these people right here in the foreground, in the car, and they're creating these lines that take you right down this street. Those are all not by accident. Those are done on purpose. You know, a pencil drawing like this, now I, th this comes, anybody who knows the, the uh, Ted Kotsky, Arthur Guptill, uh, Ernest Watson kind of stuff, that's where this came from. And I love to do these kind of works as well. But they start with the same base line drawing way underneath there. And then I, I dial the line weight back and I do the drawing over it. Here's another one, pencil technique. So people, you know? How do you get people into your drawings? Most people, architectural students and, and renderers, I never was very good at drawing people. I just never was. So what I would started to do is take a lot of pictures of them and I'd cut them out in Photoshop and save them. Or in the old days before I had the computer, I'd just keep copies of them and I create little line tracings of them like this, right? And those people ultimately make, them into, make it into the drawings. And because I travel so much, I can put the real people from the real place into the real drawing. Like this, is, this, this was shot, I, I did a lot of work for NASCAR for a long time. And um, this was down at the Homestead Speedway in Miami. And I shot all these people on race day. And then this drawing was done for, uh, for the Richmond track. And you can see all the same people are in there, you know? But they add to the quality of the place. It's not just about drawing this mixed-use building that's in the background. It's about all of the other things that are going on. Is this the, there it is. You can see this mixed-use building and all the banners and the umbrellas and the signage. All of that comes into play. The building itself is pretty simple. It's not anything complicated. It's all these other things that make it a place that you want to go and that explain. They, they tell you the story of what's happening in this place. That's where you want to get to with your drawing. Now this is a colored pencil drawing that is done over the, one of those line bases. Uh, I, colored pencil uh, was a, when I was coming through school, you know, there was a couple of really important books that came out, uh, one by Michael Doyle that used marker and colored pencil to color images. And you could get real vivid, strong colored pencil drawings. And so I, I've always enjoyed colored pencil. And it's one of those things, though, that it doesn't scan particularly well. You've got to get it very strong in order for it to read, and it has to be on very bright paper. So this is kind of the technique that I came up with. And if you look at this, it, has a, it looks a lot like my paintings that you'll see later on. They're all sort of similar. And so this is a drawing that I would do on charrette, and it would be the, the first indication. You know, it's a freehand drawing. The color is really loose. Whoop, let's go back to that. The color is really loosely done. You know, it's not all within the lines. It's got a vibrancy to it. There's a movement to the way it's drawn. So that's what I'm looking for. So, you know, people, drawing people in certain places 
you get them into your drawing. They happen to be there. Now this is in Ireland, um, in Dublin, and this was a new development down by the Wharf District. So all these buildings are invented, and this is a painting, but it's got the same quality of place that all the other stuff does. Here's, here's Dublin, you know, and here's, here's my, the new Dublin. So if you can get that into your drawings, it will have a validity to it that your clients will recognize immediately. They'll see that. They'll know that you did your homework. And when you're working in all these different places, you really have to become an expert at seeing what the vernacular of that place tells you about the place. There's the painting. Now, some of these are better than others. Granted, you always have notes that you hit really well. But to take a, a, a SketchUp model, like you guys probably build SketchUp models like this all the time, right? And they make it into your projects. I'm looking at the back wall and I see some, some models in there. But what do you do with this thing once you have it in SketchUp? Well, sure, you can put some people in it, but wouldn't you like to do that to it? You know, and that's the way that drawing ended up. Now that came from that SketchUp base. It's the same place, essentially. And it's all about how to translate, how to, how to understand what the composition needs to be. Here's another one. There's the painted version. Now this is actually done in Photoshop. This is a digital painting, not traditional media. There's no paint on this at all. It's the same line base that I used for this on Charette. Brought it back to the office and colored it in Photoshop. Um, taking it one more step, this is a project in Moscow. Taking it one more step, you can, you can manipulate it and strengthen the color so that you can use it as a full presentation rendering later on. Here's an aerial view of a project in, in Moscow. Um, you know, this, this was generated at a point at which all we really had was bubble diagrams. So being able to take something and add detail to it like this gives the client a real powerful image to go and explain to the people that are investing in this project what it really means and what it's really about. This is all digital color as well on a hand-based drawing. So we looked at a bunch of colored pencil. I'm going to go through some of these because there's a lot of images here. But even in aerial form, colored pencil works really well because you've got a movement to it. You know, there's a real strength to what it can do. I just love the quality of it. I don't do as much of this as I used to because everything has been moving more towards sort of digital stuff. But I still, you know, people love to see these things. Okay. So this is how it works. So I'm sitting in, at a charrette. And they say, okay, we need a perspective. And this was up in Skyline, Ontario. There's a, there was a ski area up there, and they wanted to build a, a mixed-use development town at the top of the hill by the ski, the ski lift. So we started talking about, okay, well, you know, we, we, we kind of like these European little villages where you walk down the street and you go to the lift, and, you know, you can get your pretzel or your beer or whatever, and, you know, you've got this really intimate place. But this is northern Canada, and it, we can't have it, we don't want it to look like Bavaria, but we want it to feel that way. So I did this little sketch you know, this can't be more than four by six inches, like index card size, just like this. And I started thinking, okay, well, what about the height of the buildings? How does that look? How about the, the width of the space of the street? How does that look? Um, what about having some sort of iconic in, in, piece at the end of the street to focus your view? Now, the lift was just over to the left over here. So there has to be this sense of arrival here, okay? So this is all within the first 20 minutes. We're all sitting around a table talking, and I go, how about this? And they said, wow, that's really cool, but can we do this and this and this? So I took that and I refined it. First thing I started to think about, this tower at the end of the street became a hot topic of discussion. What do we do with that? What does it look like? Oh, I remember a tower in the town next door to this one, blah, blah, blah. So you hear, it, it triggers people. They, they, they see something and then they can react to it. That's what you want to have happen. And this building, maybe it has an interesting sort of angle to it. This one on the side, we're still not sure what it needs to be yet. So we take it to the next level. I start adding, I add some half timbering into this. The tower is still similar, but I'm, I'm working on the detail of the massing and what that use might be on the bottom floor. This building, still don't know yet, but maybe a porch, who knows? This building, there was talk that might be a hotel, so you know the massing needs to be a certain height. And what about the road in front of here? So that goes to this. So I start to put in some detail. Here's the, a car on the road. This thing's still kind of the same. I've kind of got it where I want it to. This building's starting to evolve. And now for the first time, I'm starting to figure out what this is. What they were thinking is maybe there needs to be something that's very northern Ontario, sort of a wood frame house looking building that's, that, that addresses the street in a different way than all these, these, framed, these uh, brick structures that were going to be on the other side. 
So this is the, what the final drawing ended up. Now this all took place over about a four hour period. Okay, all these drawings went back and forth. People are looking at them and this is the way it ended up. So I've got, I've got my tower at the end here. We decided to show it in summertime, even though most of the time people are gonna look at it at, in the winter. Um, We've got this, this hotel sort of strengthened and put together. There's a little bit of angled uh, changes to the building. This now has become sort of a Dutch uh, colonial looking thing with a nice rounded porch. What the use is, we're not sure yet, but the way it masses and addresses the street is really interesting. You know, there's, there's a, a, a sense of, uh, of walk space, of drive space. It's, it's, a, it's a good view. So there's all kinds of good stuff in there. So then I threw some colored pencil on it. So this is where it ended up. This is where it ended up at the end of the shred. And they loved this. They thought this was great. They could take this and they could explain what they were thinking to the people that were involved. And people would say, yeah, I get it. I know what you're trying to do. So I took it back to the studio and I started to paint it. And this is how it would go through a paint. You know, I'd add some, uh, some, some body color to it. And this is all in pure watercolor over the same drawing. You can see how it gets denser. I started adding shadow to it. All the details started to get working. Once you put the shade and shadow on, the drawings really come alive. And this is how it ended up. So that same drawing that I did on Charette, which was done as a colored pencil drawing, can be brought back to the office and turned into this. Now this is what they can use for marketing. This is what they can use to put on their website. This is what they can use to communicate what they're thinking about. And when you do architectural renderings, the, thing that you, the way that you know that they're successful is for how long they last within the project. Like for example, if you do a drawing like this, on charrette, and the, the, the projects are just beginning, right? There's not a lot of hard information yet. If that, if that drawing lasts six months, it's pretty successful. But if the drawing becomes a touchstone for the project and it lasts years, in fact, they design around the drawing, then you know you've done really well. And a lot of these perspectives, that's what happens because you've hit the right notes. You've gotten everybody who is trying to do the project together and put them in the right place and ask the right questions. So you get an image like this. Here's a project for Disney down in Florida. You know, they're, it's, it was a new development they were building called um, Golden Oak. And this was the arrival sequence. Now, this is what they sent me. It doesn't really, I mean, it's an entrance drive with some Meisner looking buildings, you know, like sort of Venetian looking things here. But to invent something into that, and make it something is, I mean, what do you do with that, you know? So I started looking at other stuff that they'd done already, and I did this drawing. Now this drawing is all about the trees, it's all about the landscape of that Florida Orlando area and this waterways that are in there. And that's the pencil sketch that I sent them. And, and it's all about the shadow and the quality of the light and how it falls on these white buildings. You've got all these white buildings, you know, what do you do? That's the refined version. And that's the way it went out painted. Now when I take it to painting, you know, this, this tells the story pretty well. It's not bad, you know? For most purposes, that's gonna work well. But that really hits the nail on the head there. You know, I'm controlling all the light. I've got a ring of light around this thing. The shadows that I can put in in watercolor, you just can't do that any other way. You can't get that sort of versatility. The, the, the suggestion of what's going on back here, because that's all it really is. There's no detail in that. The suggestion in paint is very easy to do. Whereas, if you were to do that, go back to that digital model that we were looking at at the beginning, to try and build all that and light it in, uh, in, uh, in uh, AutoCAD and 3D Studio it would take you forever. But a painting like this, you know, they're all about this. They love this. Other images that were done for that project, here, this was the, the clubhouse. This is how it started out. And I did this sketch. And it starts to put all the people in and invention. They liked it, but they wanted to see more. They, they wanted an interior viewer. They wanted to look at what it was like to look out into the space. So I started doing all these little sketches. And these are all like half hour little things. And I would look through images that I'd find on the computer or books that we have. We have a real great library at the office of all kinds of traditional architecture. I did these little colored pencil sketches and I sent them back to them. You can see view four, I think there was like 12 of these. And you know, I'm being very careful to show them pieces of things that I think will add character. Now is there any, is there any design yet for this? Not really. This is very early on. Then they picked one that they liked, and I did a little model of it, and I lit this. This is, in, this is lit in, uh, in SketchUp. I took it into 3D Studio and lit it. I did this line drawing. There's the painting. So you go from 
preliminary stuff and you, you're able to get it to a point where it's really, it's really hitting all the notes and all the ideas that you want it to say. Does it matter that it's watercolor? Does it matter that it's digital? No. What matters is that you're able to effectively communicate the ideas that you're putting across. And the details that fall into this are important, you know, they, they tell the story. Am I going the right way? Yeah, here's some other drawings that were done from that project. And all the houses that were done for the, for, the, for the area. Now when you look at this, you can remember back to that book I showed you at the beginning and how, how, how I was influenced by that. You can see that in these paintings. You can see the sense of composition in the trees and the leaded in the landscape and all the details. You can see it in all these, right? So we talked about painting techniques, so I'm just gonna go through this kind of quickly. You know, I always start with, um, with I, I set up my palette and, I, and I, I always do little uh, gestural sketches or a color chart to know exactly how my paint is going to react on certain papers. Here's a simple SketchUp model, something that you would probably build. Here's a, this is what a freehand drawing over that SketchUp model would look like. Now, does it matter that it's traditional architecture? I've showed you a lot of traditional architecture here. That's just because we happen to do a lot of traditional architecture, but this would work if it was modern architecture, if it was uh, green architecture, whatever you're doing. This technique works for everything. So you model it, then you do a freehand sketch, and you see if that's got the right quality to it. I threw it in some landscape just to add compositional elements. You know, who puts a tree in the middle of their drawing like that? Well, the truth of it is, is if you're walking down the street and you're looking at this house, more than likely there's going to be a tree in the middle of your view. Now, if you look at this drawing, this tree is actually in a very specific location. It's, it's using what they call a golden section to have a two-third, one-third location in here. It's not by accident that it's there. Um, so the placement of things is not by, by accident. And you can see that it, it, um, it's uh, shrouding this one dormer up here, but it's not shrouding the other one. So there's a little peak there that's telling you what it is, but it's not giving you all of it. There's some hide and, you know, hide and seek going on in here. There's another one here. So there's the hard line drawing. That looks pretty good. But I kind of like the freehand. It kind of works for the stone and everything. So I, you know, I started to look at how the stone quality would be done. And then here's the final drawing. There's your tree. There's your little dormer peeking out. You know, there's another thing shrouding this. You get a sense of the house next door, which gives you the distance between the houses. There's another one beyond here. The trees are all in place. There's lots of landscape in this. And then I start painting, you know. And because I've worked everything out here, I've made all the decisions about composition, I made all the decisions about what things are gonna look like. I'm not messing with all that in the next step. I've worked it out in line form first. So when I go to paint, I'm painting. That's what I'm doing. And that's how it ends up, which is a lot of fun. Now that was done on a print that I printed out of a machine that I have at the office. So it was printed onto watercolor paper from that drawing which makes it very easy, actually. And again, looking back at those books I was telling you about, that technique right there is in those drawings from the 20s and 30s. Here's another sketch. This was done straight over a SketchUp model. These are just little gestural sketches that we did for development in New Hampshire. But the quality of the paint is what's important here. The more you do this, the more fun it gets, too. So here's some work I did in Scotland. And the reason I bring this up is you go to a place, right? You've never been there before. You're trying to figure out the place, what the architecture is like, what you have to do. So the first thing you want to do is really get yourself familiar. So you wander around looking at the quality of what it is and recording it. And we do that everywhere we go. We, we do recon trips where we go to the place and we, all we do is take photos and measure and look at what's going on there. These buildings are very different than where you see somewhere else. And then my first, my first reaction is to go and paint it and record those details. And ultimately, it makes it into the renderings of the project we're working on. This is actually, um, this was done for the Princess Foundation over there. This is a, a new town that they were building just outside of uh, Aberdeen. It has the same quality of all those places that I just was. These are all new development pieces. This is not, it's never been built yet. But the quality of that, of that wind, which is what these are called, is very strong. 
A sense of composition is worked out. Everything is put where it's supposed to be. And this, re this, this resounds with the people over there. They get this. They understand it. Here's some digital media stuff. I thought I'd put, you guys are hearing me talking about painting all the time, but this is all digital based stuff and a lot of this is newer. Um, this is a project in Nashville that we just did in November. And um, this is a drawing, it's a hand drawing. And then it's grafted with, um, with a, uh, 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 an aerial photograph underneath and then it's digitally painted. So there's a whole bunch of layers to this. But it gives you an image. Could you photograph this? Yeah, you certainly could. And we worked off a photograph for it. But what we do in this is we focus all the detail. You can zoom into this and it gets, it's as clear as it, as it could possibly be. It, 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 it edits out all the information that your eye, will trick your eye into thinking it's something else. And that's what it looks like with the development piece in it. So we go from existing conditions to the development piece. And this is powerful stuff. People, they love these images. But they're a lot of work. It's a very heavy lift to do one of these. It has to be for the right type of project. Now this was for the city of Nashville. So you know, to, to go through and do a rendering like this, you know, you're talking about the high end of what I do. Um, very expensive, very, very time consuming. There's probably two weeks of work in this. These are, these are images that were done for the Moscow project that we just finished last summer. Um, Moscow is building a new city south of Moscow to transfer a lot of their, um, their government functions outside of Moscow because the gridlock there is so bad that they can't, they can't control the traffic. So they're, they're cutting their losses and putting in a new transit system and building a new, a new place southeast of the city. And they had a competition with uh, 30 firms and we ended up winning the competition. So these are some of the images that were done. These are all di digitally colored but traditional drawing. And they start with something like this. Here's my model and Photoshop sort of montage put together. And that's how the drawing ends up. So it has a bit of the reality in it. There's the hand drawing. Here's a watercolor sketch that went in. This was the, the river in Moscow. You know, this tells as much about the project as this does. Just hits a different note. And they love this stuff. People love to see it. This is an image. They were, this is one of their building complexes. And they were wondering what it might look like at different seasons of the year. So we did a winter one, we did an evening one, and we did a summer one. But it's all the same drawing, except I changed some of the clothes because it gets really cold there. But I, I love the way this, and this, this was actually colored by uh, the guy that works with me. And you know, you can see, look at the frost coming out of their mouths, you know, because it's, you know, it gets to like 30 below there. But um, it feels like Moscow, you know, it's really cool, I think. The architecture? Well, the architecture is okay. It's all right. But it's telling the idea of what it might be like to be in a complex like that. And you can see at the end of it, there's this, uh, this iconic little tower there. So they like this. This, this was good because it, it, it tells all the stories, you know? You can see yourself in that. Now, this is, here's Moscow, and you're right outside of Red Square, and you're driving along here. And, you know, but we, we need to change a lot of stuff in this, so it goes to that. Again, digital color on a traditional. So here's another one. So we did about 25 drawings for this project. Here's the night view. This is pretty cool. This is showing what it's going to be like to be along the river system. And all of this was designed and invented. Um, this was done by uh, Joe Skibbo, who works in my office. And I, I just love the quality of the light in this. And to do this on the computer is, is pretty, pretty cool stuff, you know? These are clouds and skies that he took off of another image. You know, you can cut and paste things and use them as your palette while you're doing this. There's another, this is a night view. This is an Indian project that I was working on last summer. We were there. It was, um, it was 125 degrees there. So going outside was not so fun. But uh, working with the Indians is great. And um, they had, this was phase three. They'd have already, already built a lot of this stuff. But the architecture and the landscape, you know, it's, it's different there. But these images were, they were a lot of fun to do. There's the Nashville aerial that I showed you at the beginning. I'm not sure why it's there, but here's another Indian one. And here's some plan information. Now this is a, this is a plan drawing. Um, this is all digital. Um, but it has the feeling and character and quality. Look at the quality of the shadows. You know, there's purple and violets and blues and all that. You know, you can, you can, you can resonate something digitally with the same traditional essence of color that you get in a painting. And this reads really well on the page. It's, it's, it's been edited to read well. It, the, the trees, everything about it tells you sort of a, a bit of character. And that's not easy to do in a plan, you know? And I think that's really cool. These are some other projects. This is a project in, um, in uh, Libya. We, we were supposed to go to Libya, but we got out. We didn't go right before all this stuff happened over there. And this is some of the architecture that we're working on. There's a digital model 
of some of the stuff we were working on. Here's another one. And this is all architecture that's designed in our office. We have about 30 people that, um, that work, on, work in our office and we work on different design teams and depending on where the project is, we send one of those. Here's one of the elevation drawings for Scotland. It feels like watercolor, it looks like watercolor, but it's all digital. This is one of the, I just did these last week. Um, this is in Salt Lake City. And this is a series of drawings that I did for a big project called Daybreak. Um, the Congress of New Urbanism, if you know anything about that, is, is meeting next year, or this year in Salt Lake City. And Daybreak is featured as a, it's one of the most successful development projects in the United States. It was done by um, Rio Tinto Mining, who owns this whole valley. So these images are of the latest pieces of that area. There's a big one there. That was a heavy lift right there, I can tell you. And all this architecture is specific. You know, they've got specific house designs that needed to be worked into all of this. So other things you can do, you know, you can publish things in books. You can make your own books. These are, these are books that were done on blurb.com, which is a, a publishing site. You can make your own book up. You know, why stop there? Here's a little book of paintings that I put together, you know. Here's some stuff that we printed in the office. You never know where these images are going to go. They're going to end up somewhere. They're going to end up on somebody's desk. They're going to end up hanging on a wall somewhere. So you've got you to remember that, you know, that they're going to have a life all their own. And about six years ago, I started doing paintings, um, watercolor paintings, and trying to get into competitions doing that. So I do that now, too. Um, so I, I'm still pushing what I do. I'm still exploring different qualities of art that I want to push in my work. But I'm always still consistently doing this. Since I started with UDA, about 12 years ago, I've done about 3,000 of these images. So lots and lots and lots. So, so uh, I can end with this. Andrew Wyeth said this, and I always thought this is very true as it relates to urban design. You know, sometimes just sitting there and looking at what's going on is probably the most powerful thing you can do. Because you'll learn more about something doing that than rushing by in your busy life and looking on your cell phone and doing all that stuff. So take a couple minutes to look at things. So there you go. That's my talk. And um, what I thought we could do now is if you guys have any questions, or you can come up around the table and we can go through some of these images. Does anybody have any questions? How many people here uh, have taken art classes? Yeah? Painting classes? OK. Did you like it? Was it hard? How many people got into architecture because they like to draw? Yeah, a lot of you. Yeah, yeah. Do you still draw? Do you draw a lot? Yeah, well, drawing is like playing a musical instrument. You know, the more you do it, the more fun it gets. Um, I, it's like anything else. You need to practice and practice and practice. Um, it's also fun to watch your ideas come alive and what you're able to do with it. And when you're able to communicate it to somebody else, that's a powerful place to be. You know, I remember I've worked in a lot of different offices, and um, that point at which the client sees something that you're designing and he gets it, and he sees it, and you see it in his face, all of a sudden it re it, it's real to him for the first time. He may have been talking about it, he may have been putting money into it, he may have been doing all these things, but until he sees it for the first time, it's not really real to him. But the minute that it, if you hit that note just right, and it becomes real, then it has a chance to live. And that's an important, to know that and know what the responsibility of that is, is a really important thing. So when you're doing your drawings, remember that. It's not just about oh yeah, I'm going to do this drawing, I'm going to sit down and do this, I need to do this. Um, people that can draw in offices, they hold a, an, an enviable position because if you have to take somebody to a meeting and you need to communicate something, who do you want to have there? Do you want to have the, the CAD jockey who can go back to the office and do the, the sections or do you want to have that guy who can sit and take a napkin and go, you know, this, this, this is what we're thinking here. You know, that's, that's an important role. So drawing has its place, it certainly does. Now, you've got to be able to use a computer as well, but just bear in mind as you go through your, your educational set here that all media is important. It's not just about the computer. It's about everything that you can do. And there's a lot of folks around you that probably have years and years of experience doing this kind of stuff, and you should seek them out and find them and see what they were up to and see how they did things because, man, I'll tell you what, most of the guys that I learned from were older than me, and they were more than willing to share what, what they knew how to do. And it's... It's cool. So, great. It, yes? Yeah, it's interesting that you give us a lot of examples of uh, you know, what inspired you mm -hmm. along the way. Right. You know, to now. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot out there. Yeah. You know, but it, it's interesting, probably, you 
how do we put the uh, same area in a sense that me when I was a kid it was Tim Kowski and Professor Broadside mm -hmm. and one color by wife and some others. Yep. So just real simple things that way back then before the information explosion, there was little information anywhere about anything. It's exactly true. <laughs> Someone gave me a book when I was a kid, that's a broad size. Mm -hmm. And so, and I had a little bit of talent, so it just fueled, it just fueled me from there. So, but now, you know, you know, I've got probably thousands and thousands of examples of where we get information and what causes us to be able to do it. Yeah. We do it. So, it didn't take a lot. It doesn't, you know, that that is one of the beauties of today is that you can, if you have an interest in something, you can find people that are interested in it, and you can also find those examples. It's a really important point, because I, I agree with you. When I was, I mean, I, I, I graduated from high school in 1982, which wasn't all that long ago, really. And going and trying to find stuff, you really had to dig. I mean, you really, you came across things, and, but not like you can today. I mean, any of those books that I showed or any of those images that I showed you, you could, you could find within 30 seconds on, on the internet now. I mean, it's amazing. So having that at your disposal, there's, you, you really should, you should have a, a goal for what you want to do and, and start to assemble some things that really influence what you're doing, not just, not just what your professors say or not just, you know, it's good to have that stuff around you and have it, you know, have prints and images of it so you can look at it from time to time and see whether it's resonating with you or not. It's really important. Uh, is there anything that you can use the, the sketch of <coughs> Based on really, really early stuff, mm -hmm. just blocking models. Yep. Because as a, as a designer in office, that's about all I get into is a blocking model. Yep. And then you do overlays, you put the detail of one version over that or another version. And of course, the nice thing about the model is that you can do capture different views. That's right. So it's not like having to just plot out perspective after perspective mm -hmm. or, you know, just different things. So the computer really helps in that way. But Absolutely. It's not, give you a lot of information and mm -hmm. just get, get the essence of what you want to do and then you can check everything else. So, and as a, as most design, senior designers in most offices, that's as far as they get mm -hmm. up front because you're just exploring ideas. Nothing's in concrete, so there's nothing really to put on the computer yet. That's right. So somebody, you sit down with someone and they buy off on a, a scheme of version mm -hmm. and then you're off to the race. That's right. Yeah. I think the, the, the one disconnect that I see and I, is that the early design stuff that we're just talking about is, is a great way to, to flesh out ideas. But the thing you have to be careful about is when, that, when the, the idea is, is set upon, when you make that step to the computer, when it becomes hard information, that you're able to preserve what that original, that hand drawing quality had to get it into, into, into CAD. Um, that could be a bit of a challenge, but it seems to be uh, you know, it seems to be easier than it used to be. CAD was so cumbersome to, to try and manipulate and get hard information off of what, you, what in essence was a hand design. But it seems these days that it's, you know, a lot of folks in our office, you know, we're jumping back and forth all the time between hand drawing and digital media. And the more that your, your staff communicates with each other clearly, because a lot of the senior guys, like me for example, I mean, I know how to use SketchUp, but I am by no means an expert. I know how to use Photoshop, I know how to use all these programs. But I look to the younger folks that really know how to manipulate media like that to take it out of my hands once I get it as far as I can get it and let them run with it. But you still have to, everybody has to work together because the last thing you want to do is not have communication between you know, the folks that have been designing for years and years and years and the folks that are just coming into the, into the, into the marketplace. Um, you know, this is a challenging time because architecture has been gone through some pretty rough patches over the last four years or so. Um, but I, I think it's going to change. I, I, I do think that things have, the, the business essentially has changed in the last four years. It's not what it was. Um, and media has a big part of that. Um, the computer, if you look at the advancements that have been made with the iPad and your phones and all these things, over the, it's just, ha things are changing, you know, annually or biannually, the way work is done. You just have to keep on top of it. Um, but the pencil and the hand and the eye still are the ones that, do the genius designs. I mean, when I, when I sit down with um, really well-known architects, they all start with that. That's where they go. So, any other questions? You want to come up and look at some stuff?
Anybody who didn't get a chance to do that before? Come on up. 